Hey John, you know what's awesome? What's that, Rick? Video games. Hey, video games are awesome. It'd be awesome to make video games too. Mmm, but it would be a lot of hard work. Could be a lot of fun. Yeah, you're right. We should make video games. All right. All it took was a conversation like that back in 1980. In the late 1970s, the world of computer science was booming. Technology was advancing so quickly that not only could families own computers in their homes, but there was a thriving competitive market for them. There were winners and losers, just like today, but there was no shortage of options on the market, and one of the leaders in the field was Commodore, whose advancements in home computing was inspiring a new generation of programmers and engineers. In 1978, a young Satoru Iwata bought his first computer, a Commodore PET. He became obsessed with dismantling the machine and putting it back together, learning exactly how it worked inside and out. Later that year, he attended the Tokyo Institute of Technology as a computer science major, and even his engineering professor, Tomohiko Uematsu, said Iwata could write programs faster, better, and more accurately than any of his peers. While he spent his school time amazing his teachers, he spent his free time amazing his employers. During his time in college, he got work as an unpaid intern at Commodore Japan, excited to learn more about his favorite systems. And even when he wasn't there, he was still surprising people. While all this was going on, he was renting an apartment in Aki... Uh, uh, Akihabara. Akihabara. With some friends, where they spent their time creating their own games. Classmates living nearby often referred to Iwata's room as Game Center Iwata. He was so proud of his creations, he would bring them around with him to show off to people. One of his favorite stops was the nearby Seibu department store, where, as luck would have it, the computer department's employees had started a company of their own. In 1980, they formally asked Satoru Iwata to join their fledgling company, HAL Laboratory. Now when we talk about other game developers like Capcom or Sega or even Minakuchi Engineering, what made them mainstays for their time was their ability to strike gold right away. That wasn't the case for HAL. In fact, when you look at the early library, it's pretty clear how they became part of the Nintendo machine. You see, at the outset, HAL had a few ideas they stuck to hard, but nothing that seemed to be making much money. It probably didn't help that their very first game, Jelly Monsters, on the Commodore VIC-20, was a blatant Pac-Man clone resulting in intervention from Atari. In 1982, following his graduation, Satoru Iwata was hired to HAL full-time as only their fifth employee and their first programmer. By the following year, he became the company's coordinator of software production and traveled to Nintendo's headquarters in Kyoto to make a plea in person for permission to develop games for the NES. They said yes, and so the work began, resulting in their first commercial release, the NES port of the 1982 arcade game, Joust. A long and fruitful relationship was soon to follow. Their flagship was a series beginning on the Microsoft MSX in 1985 called Eggerland, known in the West as Adventures of Lolo when the series moved to the NES in 89. Its main characters might look familiar to you, a pair named Lolo and Lala. While Eggerland brought in modest sales, it never took off in a way that would put HAL on the map, and the company's 11-year struggle came to a head with the dual release of Hyperzone on the SNES and Metal Slater Glory on the Famicom. Both games were impressive for their time. Hyperzone was one of the first games released on the Super Famicom and made use of the revolutionary Mode 7 capabilities of the system. However, the wildly successful F-Zero released on the platform in 1990 kept Hyperzone from gaining a strong foothold. Metal Slater Glory had it even worse. Based on the 1984 manga Akutenso Fixalia, the game spent more than four years in development, absolutely maxing out the capabilities of the Famicom and requiring both the rare and expensive MMC5 integration circuit and an 8 megabit cartridge, the largest ever made for that system. Basically, it was a beast of a game and was arguably the most technologically advanced game ever made for the console. Which would be saying something if the Super Famicom hadn't already been out for a year at the time. Metal Slater Glory failed to make a mark, both due to the poor release timing as well as all the resources poured into the huge development process. It pushed HAL Laboratory to the brink of bankruptcy. They were going to need a miracle to survive, but luckily a rising star was on his way to save the company and create one of gaming's most iconic and beloved franchises. Thank you.